1 Peter 3, we're going to be in verses 8 through 22. And that means next Sunday, you read 1 Peter. Man, you guys can count. 1 Peter 4 for next Sunday. Hopefully we'll get through the whole thing next Sunday. We're in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 22 today. Last week we left off talking about the roles of wives and husbands and marriage. What makes women wives beautiful and what makes men husbands honorable. Okay? And so now we move on to all Christians. So hopefully that's all of us in this place this morning. Anybody that proclaims Jesus as their Savior, Peter is now directing his attention to them. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 10. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. And He will grant you His blessing. For the Scriptures say, and He is quoting Scripture here, If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. All right, so as we talked about last time, wives and husbands, we turn our attention to all Christians, anybody and everybody who believes in and follows Jesus Christ. Remember, this is pre-Reformation. This is uh, so. Therefore, it's pre-denomination, and at this point, Christianity is still like a Jewish sect. And so Torah is their scripture, but they also rely on letters uh, from early church fathers like Peter, like this one, preaching and teaching that is uh, moving around their area from early church fathers. So that's what they're relying on as far as their quote-unquote Christianity. Because there was no official Christian scriptures uh, yet at, at, at this point. So, uh, as you can imagine, there might have been some disunity in what was uh, believed. Uh, there were people that would go around and, and teach the wrong stuff on purpose and or maybe not. And so, uh, there was some disunity that evolved from the early church. Listen, uh, unity among Christians is vital. It is something most utmost importance. You know, of course we have, when I talk about Christians, I talk about all denominations now and uh, anybody that says they follow Jesus. We have differences in how we practice, right? We have differences in how we practice our faith. But listen, the fundamental belief that unifies all Christians is Jesus Christ. What He taught, how He lived. And we are to reflect that as we follow. And, and Peter outlines this to clarify how we should be unified. Disunity in the church between Christians, between denominations, it does not bring glory to God. In fact, it, it doesn't bring people to Jesus. In fact, it's ammunition for Satan. He loves to get involved in disunity and division. Divide and conquer is his strategy. Peter says, one mind to be unified, to have one mind. Now, we can't push and squash our brains together. But the one mind he's talking about is the one mind of Jesus Christ. Have the same mind of Christ. So if you and I have the mind of Christ and someone who is around the world in a place we don't even know of who is a follower of Christ has the mind of Christ, then guess what? We are of one mind. And that is Jesus Christ. And we can know the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit, through God's Word. So, for all Christians to be of one mind, we must be tapped into these things. Two important things to be tapped into as Christians. What did I say? Holy Spirit, God's Word. God's Word. Otherwise, if we are not tapped into these things, and, and we are not working to be a unified and to be of one mind with other Christians around the world and even in our own churches if we're not doing these things otherwise we are single minded and that single is ourselves quite frankly we are selfish alright 
And the mind of Christ is much different than the mind of the world, the mind of being selfish, the mind of being single-minded. And Peter gives us some of that example. We're going to put it on the screen. So let's look at the differences just for a minute. The differences between the mind of Christ, the one mind that we're seeking to be a part of, and being selfish, being single-minded selfish. All right? We have sympathy versus hostility. All right? Peter, Peter notes this in his letter. Sympathy versus hostility. Sympathy, of course, is being of one mind, being having the mind of Christ, and hostility would be being selfish. Love versus hate. We all know what Jesus says. Love your enemy, right? Tender hearted versus hard hearted. Humble versus proud. And then lastly, Peter goes over retaliation versus blessing. All right. I've got those mixed up, maybe on purpose. <laughs> Retaliation versus blessing. Retaliation is not being of one mind. All right. And of course, blessing is uh, being having the mind of Christ. And 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 if you heard in Scripture, Peter talks about payback, right? We think about payback, we think about getting even, right? We think about uh, how can I disrupt the person who did me wrong's life, right? Okay, you with me? How can I hurt them like they hurt me, or hurt them worse than they hurt me? That's retaliation. But that is not christ -like. That is not being of one mind. Uh, and that is not following Jesus. In fact, Peter says... The payback is in how you bless them. A blessing is a payback. All right? So we pay somebody back by blessing them. Jesus taught us this, and Peter continues to teach us this. As Christians, our payback for someone doing evil to us, someone insulting us, is to bless them. Retaliation is what they expect. What they're prepared for. What they're waiting for. But, what if we blew their minds? And instead of those things, what they're waiting for, what they're expecting from us, what they're wanting maybe even, what if we blew their minds with a blessing instead? Blessing is the payback. And I know this is hard, but Jesus calls us to be like him and he did hard stuff. And guess what? We have to do hard stuff too. We should do hard stuff too. So payback with a blessing. I don't know what that looks like for you in, in any situation you're in where you feel the urge for retaliation, but yet I don't know what that look might, blessing might look like for you. But that's when you're tapped into the Holy Spirit of God's Word and allow Him to guide you to the blessing instead of the retaliation. Let's move to 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, this has been our, uh, I believe last week this was our benediction last word, but we begin today. So if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. We talked about this in our uh, growth group as we did evangelism and apologetics. How there are some people that tell others about Jesus by carrying signs in the middle of, of, of like uh, festivals in towns and it says, I hate these people. You know? 
or you're going to hell because you are doomed. All right, there's a way, it says here, in a gentle and respectful way, be ready to explain the hope you have. Okay? We say this all the time. We're going to say 50,000 times. How we do what we do is just as important as what we do. Okay? Banshee was to be done in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good. That is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And the water is a picture of baptism. I'm going to talk about that a little bit because I've never thought about the flood being a picture of baptism. I'm going to talk about that. Which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to, uh, to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last verse, 22. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers except His authority. Uh, first thing, number one, don't be afraid to follow Jesus. Okay? Don't be afraid to follow Jesus. Don't be afraid to do good in Jesus' name. And I'll say this again. We are, we are blessed to live in the country that we do. Uh, we don't have to fear for our lives to follow Jesus and do good in His name. It's not something that we, we don't live in fear here because we're followers of Christ and we do good in His name. So we are blessed in that. We don't fear for our lives, but I do think we fear for our reputations. We might be afraid to talk about Jesus or do good in Jesus' name because we're concerned with our reputation. What will people think of me? What will people say about me? I don't want people to think I'm this Jesus freak. That's, that's an old term, isn't it? I don't want to be considered holier than thou. I, I, I don't think we're afraid of for our lives here yet, but we're afraid for our reputation and what others might, group might put us in. And so instead of what, looking for ways, as Christians in, in America, instead of looking for ways to promote Jesus and tell people about Jesus, what we do is we do nothing. We, we don't do anything. We, we just go throughout our daily lives and do all the things, but do all the things without saying anything about Jesus. I want to remind you what Jesus said about this in Matthew. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So we just read in Peter, he's there Jesus is there. He's gone to heaven. He's sitting in the place of honor in heaven. Next to God. He has authority there. And in, in Matthew, he said, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Now, I don't think we're in the denial phase. I don't think that's the case. But I do think we are not acknowledging Jesus like we should be as Christians. In our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes. We are not promoting Jesus. Instead, we are just doing nothing. We're doing all the things. Taking our kids to ball games. We should going to school and going to work, but not making Jesus, promoting Jesus as a part of that. And 
Now listen, we are a people filled with hope, are we not? And as a people filled with hope in a hopeless world, other people should want to know where that comes from. <laughs> so we should be exuding some sort of hope in our lives. And other people are going to want to know, where does that come from? People will be interested in the hope you have if you're promoting Jesus, if you're exuding Jesus in your life. And some of those people are going to want it for themselves. Because we live in a hopeless world, there's a lot of people that are living hopeless lives. And, and they're going to want it for themselves. And there's others that don't want to criticize it. Like, they're going to want to use it as a point to, to, to criticize you and, and, and <coughs> arguments. But most are going to see the hope that lives inside of you and they're going to be like, I want what she or he had. I want what they have. This is it's pretty hopeless right now. I want what they have. And so when that becomes the case in your life, when that becomes the case, you should be ready to explain what you got. You with me? You should be ready to explain, and not just to explain it, but to do it in a way that is gentle, like Peter said, gentle and respectful. Explain the hope that you have. Explain the hope that we have. To the people that want to hear and receive it, and also to the people that, that want to hear and reject it. We, we've got to be ready to explain the hope that we have in a hopeless world. Now, our hope, of course, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's our hope, right? That's our hope. And so I want you to think about just for a moment, how do you answer if someone is to ask you this question? Just think about it. How are you so hopeful? Where, where, where does your hope come from? If someone were to actually ask you that question, they may not say hope for. They might not even use the word hope. They, where does your joy come from? They might say that. How do you have peace in this time of struggle? They might ask it that way. How are you going to explain it? What will you say to them? Here's a person that's hopeless and they see the hope in you and they want to know. How do you explain it? Pete, Peter gives us some help. And it's the gospel. It's the good news. You might want to word it differently. Verse 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. I'm not asking you to memorize the scripture. I'm just letting you know that there it is. Put it in your word. Be able to explain it. But he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. There, there, there's your... God, okay? But a lot of times we stop there. and we. But, but I want us to skip to verse 22. There's more. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities, all powers except His authority. So thank you, pray about how will I answer that question that comes to me? And then I want you to pray and think about, or pray, that you will have the opportunity this week, this day, to answer that question. Because if you have the answer, shouldn't you be able to answer? And God will give you the opportunity to do that. Always be prepared, always be ready to answer the question, to explain where your hope comes from. I'm going to share with you a, a, a quick, uh, as you are in the world and you want to tell people about Jesus, but you're like, I don't know how, and I don't want to be overbearing, I don't want to come across. I want there's three points you can do really quick. This is a really quick evangelism trick, okay? It's called Phil Felt Family. All right? Feel, felt, family. So if you're talking to somebody and you want to tell them about Jesus, and or they're debating you, they're like, ah, you know, I don't know. Say, well, I know how you feel. Right? I know how you feel because I felt the same way. 
but this is what I found. All right, you with me? Feel, felt, found. I know how you feel, because I felt the same way. Here's what I found. It's a great way to, to lead your conversation into uh, the good news and to talk about Jesus and, and to relate to people. Feel, felt, found. Now, let's move to, before we end, um, Noah. Noah and the ark. I told you I never until now I call of Noah and the flood as a picture of baptism like it, until this. And I think it's because when we look at the flood story, we look at all that was lost rather than what was saved. Because when I was a kid and you would go to the doctor's office, uh, there would be this blue I've told y'all about this before. It's a blue book, and it said Bible stories on it. And I would pick it up, and it had these awfully illustrated, terribly scary illustrated pictures of Bible stories. I appreciate the, the, the intent, but I, the practice, the, the rollout was not good. It was... And... and I remember flipping through and seeing Noah, the story of the flood, right, as a kid. And the picture was of lots of water, big ark, people banging on the doors, help, let me in, we're drowning. Okay. As a kid, that's, that's scary. Now, I'm not saying it didn't happen that way I, at all. But that gives you the context as to why my picture of Noah and the flood is never a picture of baptism for me. And I, why I always looked at it as loss rather than gain. And maybe you look at it the same way. All that was lost, not, not what, was, what, was, what was saved. Because when we look at baptism and we're here baptizing someone, what do we look at? It's the contrary. We look at baptism, what is saved. We celebrate what is saved, not what is lost. But we forget in, in Noah's story that his family, he and his family, followed him into the ark. They were saved. There was great mercy by God in that. He didn't totally, which you very well couldn't have, get rid of human existence. Start from zero again. There was great mercy in those that were on the ark. We forget that no one and his family were saved. And both sets of people were confronted by water. And, and, and listen, remember... One set obeyed God and they, and, and, and they built the ark and they got on the boat and they were saved. The other, they didn't obey God, did they? They, they didn't obey God and, and they were lost. And so there was an opportunity there for obedience. So, no one flood. It is it, it is a picture of baptism, maybe different, but it is a picture of baptism. And what opportunity was there, and what was saved from the flood waters? Now, listen, we are saved because of Jesus. All right, we are saved because of Jesus. That's it. Here. And now he is back in heaven. He is with God the Father. And he sits. And he intercedes to the Father. There's no sin. There's no sin greater than what he did on the cross. For us. His blood covers it all. I want everybody to close your eyes and, and, 
and bow your heads with me. Father God, we thank you for your words today. We thank you that we finished up verse number three. It took us a couple weeks, Lord, but we thank you for what you taught us through it. And as we read through 1 Peter 4 this week, I pray that you would speak to us. God, I, I would pray this morning that, that we would just understand how very much you love us. How very much you love us and how much you have called us to be a light in your world, to tell people about Jesus. To exude the hope that we have. God, it can be difficult day to day to do that. Life is hard. The world is dark. Father God, will you remind us day to day that you sent your son Jesus, the light of the world, to die in our place. This world is not our forever place. God, remind us of that day to day so that we have the strength to exude that hope, to, to tell people about that hope. God, I pray for someone here who has not received Jesus as their Savior. They have not been free from sin, then eternal life is not. Lord, I pray today that their life will be forever changed, eternally changed. That you would speak to them. And God, may we stand and sing in just a moment and all may be fresh and goodness. To follow you, to know you, and to make you known. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.